I probably just put it in sausage or grind once I remove the bones. Any of you uh, participated or seen a slaughter before? Backyard. So, what's that? Backyard. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good way to do it. Um, typically, the animal is stunned some way or another. Uh, if you're doing it backyard, usually you're using a 22. Um, in uh, slaughterhouses, they're either using a stun gun or a bolt gun that's uh, punching it in the head, basically rendering it unconscious. Um, then they'll stick it right in the neck, cutting the jugular. They'll hang it, let it bleed out. The whole process really shouldn't take longer than about 20, 30 minutes. Um, then once it's stuck and, and bled out, you want to hang it, uh, depending on the animal, for various times with beef. Um, two week minimum, I prefer three to four weeks. Um, before I even cut into any of the primals. Uh, with lamb, ideally you hang it for a week. You can hang it for a few days and start cutting it. Or you can, after a day you can start playing around with that. I like to hang it for two days, usually let the skin um, dry out a little bit, thicken up a little bit. Why do you wait so long on beef? Uh, that's a great question. So um, when you're hanging it, uh, so obviously as soon as it's killed, it's dead and it's starting to rot. And that's one of your biggest jobs as a butcher is controlling that process, controlling the rotting process. A lot of different ways of doing that. Um, the main way you're doing that is by keeping it in a cool refrigerated area. Um, so walk-ins are around 36 to 38 degrees. Um, you want around 60% humidity, depending on what you're doing. Um, so once you're hanging it, the enzymes in the uh, animal are breaking down the proteins which is making it more tender. It's also losing uh, moisture, which is making the flavor more concentrated. The longer you hang it, the better that gets. Um, when you think about a steer, it's usually around two years old. It has some time on it. It's been moving around a lot, especially with pastured animals. So you really need the, that minimum of two weeks to uh, make the muscles ten tender and also really draw out that flavor in it. Um, and that's all dry aging is, is pushing that process even further. Um, I like to dry age things for a minimum of 30 days. I really like to do 60 days. Um, and you're getting a really different flavor at that point. Um, you're getting this sort of mushroomy flavor. And, and what you're tasting is, is um, really actually sort of um, bacteria sort of coursing its way through the muscles. Um, you see that white mold. Hopefully you're seeing white mold on the outside of it. That's a good sign. You don't want to see black or orange or green mold. That white mold is a sign that everything's happening properly, and that's when you're going to start to get that really rich umami flavor. Um, and the same thing with lamb. It, it's, you're, you're developing that flavor. It also, I think it, um, and it, it tenderizes, too. That's why you want to do a week. With uh, mutton, I like to do at least two weeks. Now the downside is you're losing water weight, so you're going to yeah. get... But not a lot. Right. A little bit. Some some farmers who are sending it out want the two weeks so they can have it as big when it comes back so they get more for it. Yeah. You're, so. I think after two weeks you've lost between from, from live weight or from hot weight, which is just killed, hanging, just bled out, to, to on my block, ready to break down, you've lost you know, six to ten percent uh, moisture. Um, and you know, when you're paying however much for, for a live for an animal, every percentage starts to count. You leave the intestinal organs and trash before you Oh that that's that happens as soon as it's stuck and bled out you eviscerate it. Yeah. Um, so from from live to hot weight you've lost uh, thirty percent. And that's the blood weight and that's the organ weight. And well, then you keep losing more and more, you know, you're losing bones, you're losing water. So when what you end up with, what you started with, is so drastic, you know, so much smaller. Um, and that's where all the cost comes in. What did this cost? I don't know. Uh, this lamb cost 560? 67. 
I generally pay around five fifty a pound for one hundred percent grass fed uh, local lamb. I, I've yet to see a lower price. I don't know what. what yeah, this was is. just over that, yeah. but that includes the Sodexo markup. Sure. <laughs> uh, so that I mean that's really pretty standard. Uh, so the beef that we buy from Whipperwell, you know, the stuff that's you know, grazed on on our farm and sold through um, Alan, he does a minimum of three weeks on these tanks. <laughs> That's why I love Alan. <laughs> <laughs> hey, buddy. It's me. Yeah. So we have the shoulder. There are a couple different things you can do with it. Now you can leave a hole, rest the whole thing. Um, you could break it down right here, bottom shoulder from the top shoulder, and have what's called sort of your square roast up here. Um, you could bone out the whole thing and have tram and, and make sausage. That's uh, often what I do with it. Um, and then we also have the shank, which I also love. Um, similar to the neck, it has a ton of flavor, but it really needs to be braised. So the, sh the shank, I'll cut off with a saw. Just going to score it. Let's try the knuckle. How long would it take to bone out the whole thing? Because it's soft. The whole lamp? But that? How long would it take to bone out that whole thing if you're going to make sausage out of it? You know, it's not that long. Really? Uh, for me, it should, <laughs> hopefully it should only take a few minutes. Um, wow. You know, if you're still learning, it, it takes a while. Um, the tricky part really is the blade. But all you have is this rib cage, the blade, and the, a little part of the arm bone. Mm -hmm. It's not that bad. Um, and we can do that if you want. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I don't know what your plans are with it. No, it, it'll be good to see. I mean, it. if you haven't seen what a blade looks in the meat, you're going to have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll be, it'll be a good idea to see where the blade is placed and the shape of it, because that's, that's, I mean, obviously you can, you can see the rib go right along with it. The bone shank's going to come up. You're just going to do that. But the blade is definitely the toughest. So this is where the brisket would be on beef. There's no brisket here, it's too small, but I'll start by just sort of... Is that like a cut that the butchers keep for themselves, one of those like special... Oh, you're not going to want the brisket. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is all throw away. Right <laughs> That's right. But it's, but it's like, I mean, like, hanger steak used to be the throwaway part that... Well, the hanger steak is that called the butcher steak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Very fast. Yeah, we're throwing it away. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> found out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you know what the hanger steak is? Um, is it like a the end of the tender or? Two muscles with a the hanger. And yeah, so it hangs right down here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a fairly inactive muscle. Mm -hmm. Really what it does is it connects the organs that's from okay. the body. I mean, it's why it has that strong sort of livery and bloody flavor. Uh, it's one of my favorites. On lamb, it's, it's you know, not worth your effort, but on beef, it's great. And sometimes, depending on the size of the pig, you can find a decent size hanger on the pork. The Sharon Farm Market sells something that's like this and like this, and I call it a hanger steak. Like what? It's huge. It's a piece of meat like this. It's not a hanger steak. It is not a hanger steak. <laughs> well, yeah. I used to cut off of beef um, the sirloin flat and call it a sirloin hanger, which is a name I've made up for yeah. it. But it's probably yeah. something is like it, that. Is it well marbled? Because this was really well marbled, made but it's huge. Yeah. Well, we get a lot of flat. Have you seen the flats we use, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that? Mm -hmm. Bigger, actually. So I'm just taking my knife and following. The bone, just seaming it off. See how I'm moving my wrist? Yeah. You're going along the bone. Is that the bone? Right? Yeah. You know, I'm used, it's almost like the, the tip of the knife is an extension of my fingertip and I'm feeling my way around. So, Chris, you were saying, um, 
you know, how would you debone it for a sausage grind? So the downside is we're actually not allowed to grind. <laughs> um, so when we, when we make sausage, we're buying like a ground product. Mm -hmm. We get ground pork. Um, so I think that's, that's obviously the one downside, like where we haven't just been getting our animals back. Can't so much stew meat. Because <coughs> they, uh, that particular? The students are that particular. Oh, yeah, some students. You guys want to eat a lot of stew? Um, <laughs> <laughs> So what you're saying is that the, that the, the laws uh, governing the codes governing the production of sausage really are that uh, that particular? You're not no, it's an exit policy that we can't grind. But that's a, but that's a safety reason, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, oh, it, yeah. So. It, I mean, so. the, even the professional grinders, they have to have very serious asset plans in place. Mm. Um, and I mean, you have to consider and there's a policy written, it's for the lowest common denominator. Like, we've got a funny set of people here, but they're the ones who are really into this sort of stuff. I mean, you, but you've got to have. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's something that's a safety. It's a, it's a worker it's a safety, safety thing. Or, or no, it's safety. probably more of a food safety. At this point, grinders are pretty safe. It's going to be really hard to hurt yourself on yeah. a grinder. Um, I let my son grind chicken with me. Like, when he was three, so. Uh, <laughs> no, I was just thinking of the, yeah. the classic thing about sausage making, right? Is, you know, yeah, you know, there's a finger or two. But, um, <laughs> no, this is all food safety. I mean, yeah. uh, it's, if it's not cleaned really well and done at the right temperatures, and held at the right temperatures, um, I mean, you're, you're mixing meat. There's, right now, there's only so many surfaces there could be pathogens on. When you mix that all in, What's in the grind? Plus the grinder heats up the meat while it's grinding it. Yeah. It's cold. Got to keep that all cold. Yeah. So I'm working on writing a HACCP plan for a grinder we would put in the walk-in refrigerator out at the farm. Right. Wow. That's a good idea. So there are these fin bones shoot up off of the vertebrae. So that I'm coming now this way, following those. I removed this. <coughs> it's called the rubber band. It's the <laughs> tendon that allows for the animal to graze all day. Go like this. It snaps the head back. Um, it's one of the only uh, things you find find in the carcass <coughs> that won't break down no matter how long you cook it. So you, have, you always have to remove it. Um, you I'm know, sure other they found tendons. some use for that. What's that? I'm sure they found some use for that. Right? I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Not an edible use. No. <laughs> oh, but it's a pretty amazing thing. It really looks and feels like a rubber band. It looks it. Um, because A, they're probably not doing whole animals, so they're probably not getting that in. Um, and that's really the only thing I can think of. I always, my shop, I always had. You do? And uh, rib, yeah. I'm trying to find them, so it's yeah, good to know. <laughs> well, I'll show you when we get there, but put them right here, and then you've got the beautiful wrap with your riblets. So now, the bones, you know, although lamb maybe is not the best example of this. I like to save as much as possible, and you can make stock with it. It's how you make some of that money back. You know, trim off all this little stuff, excess stuff, you use later for frying. And that's really one of the many advantages of doing whole animal. You really can make some of that stuff back by, by spending a little more time with it. That's, you know, really good meat, really good flavor in there. And when I have my apprentices, this is something I would make them do, just remove that chain right there, because again, that's really good meat. So I took the 
the rib cage out. Now we want to remove the blade. You break down the uh, shoulder almost like it's removing layers of a book or turning the pages of a book. So there's this first layer following the seam. See what I mean by the seam? I was just sort of not really cutting through any muscle, I'm just following the natural layers. And it took me, following that seam took me right down to where the, the blade is. So I can leave it on if I wanted to tie this as a boneless lamb shoulder rose. This way it's still intact, but I've gotten to the, where the blade is. Next I want to remove the, uh, the end of the uh, leg bone there. And you see what I'm doing here? Anybody wants to put their thumb right there? You can feel where the joint is. Oh, yeah. Oh. So that's where you're going to cut. Yeah, I'm just going to pop that joint. Following the shape of the bone. So now, only one more thing to remove, shoulder blade. Again, I'm just using my knife, the right tip. You see, most of the time I'm only using this much of the knife. To the knife. Most of the time, that's all you want to be using. You don't want to be cutting into any muscles. 
that you want to use. Shoulder blades are tricky. They're always different shapes. Mm -hmm. And the thing you really want to watch out for is that ridge on the bottom, which I'll show you in a second. That ridge oh, right wow. here. Wow. And on pork, which you'll see in a little bit, it really curves. Those are my worst cuts have been from deboning the shoulder blade. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a task to get it out to. It really is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I there have been days where I've just done like spend the morning deboning shoulders, um, and you get into the rhythm of it, but it takes a while. Um, of course, this is still a little frozen right here, so I made it a little trickier. You really, ideally, when you remove this, you're seeing a lot of white. And you're mostly seeing bone. Um, so this is your shoulder. You could sort of roll it up and tie it as a roast, cut it into stew, grind it. But uh, you, know, you have a lot of options. And, and it, it's great grind because there's uh, a really nice fat to meat ratio. Shoulders tend to be about 70-30, um, which is really what you want for like sausages and stuff. Um, when you do a slow, low roast with it, it, it keeps it moist. Um, you know, and then depending on what you're going to do with it, if you were going to tie it as a roast, you might want to remove some of the silver skin. What did you call it? Silver skin? Silver skin? Yeah, it's sort of the tough membrane. Uh -huh. um, and again, it, at this point, you're, you're doing it more for uh, visual effect than anything else because if you do do something slow and low or if you are going to grind it, that stuff's just more or less going to disappear. Um, and I, I like it in grind. It, it adds a little more toothiness to it, um, which I like in grind. I don't like my grind to be overly uh, tender or mushy. Um, but you know, that, that looks a lot nicer in the case <laughs> than that does. Um, but that's, you know, that's really more of a retail butcher thing than it is for uh, kitchen use or, or you know, larger scale use. Um, but if I, you know, just all depends on, on what you're doing with it in the end, where, where, where it's going to end up. Probably the you know the most famous cut on lamb, your your rack of ribs. Uh, I enjoy them. This is uh, what would be your skirt steak. Actually, pretty decent size on this animal. Um, but again, too too small to really bother doing anything with, other than throwing it into your frying. You guys know what the skirt is? No. It protects the organs. It's it's actually part of the diaphragm. Yeah. 
and that's why it has that great but unusual texture, the long grain. So, looks pretty familiar, right? Mm -hmm. Again, this is totally personal preference on where you break it. Um, I was taught, you know, you go to that sort of nub of fat right there, and two or three fingers, depending on how thick your fingers are. Um, <laughs> you know, so that looks right to me. Mark it. Same thing, looking for the, the tip of that node of fat. Three fingers up. Now this is something I would do on a bandsaw if I had a bandsaw. Zip, two seconds. Uh, but it's just as easy to do this way. And so, again, I'm going to try to create a false sort of straight line using this as my sort of straight edge. Well, I'm not, uh, unfortunately, I'm not at the store anymore, at the butcher shop. I'm a produce manager now. But um, yeah, we sold a lot of lamb bacon, a lot of lamb ham. It's really fun. So there's a cap on this that you're going to want to remove. Again, you're following a very natural scene. No almost do it with my hands. And a lot of the cutting I'm doing, you're not, it's, it's, you know, and this is more of a European style thing, you're not cutting through the muscle, you're cutting with the muscle. You're following the natural sort of layers. See how little I actually use my knife? You use that cut for stew or is that for? For this? Yeah. Yeah, I would probably just throw it into grind. Um, it's not really thick enough to stew up. Plus, I really love lamb sausage, so anything to add. I'm going to be looking for lamb bacon now. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. And that, that, you would use this cup for the lamb bacon. This, this is the I know that. It sounds really good. Yeah. <laughs> I, what I had wasn't, uh, or didn't taste like it was cured with any uh, sugar or sweetener. Like it was just okay. salt cured. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I, I would like to try, I mean, I, 
Uh, my bacon's sweeter probably than most anyway. You do ours with our pork bacon with maple syrup. So. Uh, so yeah, I'd really like to try ham. You cure it and smoke that. Yeah, we we brined it for three days, depending on how big it was. Yeah. I had never, I've never had anything like that. It. it was really. Yeah. Can really you say amazing. tell how you do it again? Yeah, so we would brine it. We uh, kind of as you would do a pork ham. Um, so we did a brine, salt, Orange, sugar. Uh, what did we do? Juniper and something else. A lot of alpine. Yeah, herbs. kind of alpine herbs. Um, yeah. Brine it for about three days. It depended upon the weight, and it was I kind of. Did figured out a recipe based upon what you would do for pork per pound, and uh, you know, playing around also, and then um, pull it out of the brine and hang it to let it dry uh, before you smoke anything. You want it to dry off so that you get a nice smoke protein on the outside, otherwise it sort of turns black when you smoke it. Um, and then smoke it for um, gosh, I don't even remember what time I used to do that. Probably two twenty-five. No, we probably started it lower and then cranked it up a little bit. Probably started it around 140 or 150 and went up to 190 maybe um, for a few hours until it would come up to like 125. Now, which part of the lamb are you using? For the leg. The leg. Mm -hmm. The whole leg? Uh, yeah. We can jump to the leg if you want now. <laughs> Did you go in uh, or did you keep them running? Uh, we usually left. Mm. We started at the bottom. Yeah, we, I think we left the bone in initially, and then it just ends up being a lot easier it's after the fact yeah. to slice. Um, it, I mean, it creates, it, it makes it easier to create a uh, mm -hmm. more complete cure. So yeah. When you leave the yeah. bone in, we sometimes we're getting sort of a, a gray ring. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So Less of an issue with the lamb, but with the fork hams that are so much bigger, it's hard to get the brine to penetrate all the way in. Yeah. Do you think the, uh, the leg would open itself to do like a serrano? Right. Well, that's what you said. You're going to try dry curing. Okay. Yeah. Particularly, I want to try it with mutton. But um, yeah, I think it's going to be amazing. Yeah. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be. It's going to be. No, that's not we're for everyone doing. Yeah. yeah. That has to be about forty. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> Be a pretty intense flavor yeah. for some people. Yeah, <laughs> Especially with have you have you done any uh, wild animal like elk or no, I would love them. I particularly love elk, so that'd be really fun. Yeah. So this is the leg. Maybe my favorite part of the lamb, other than the neck. Um, I love it as a roast during the winter. Butterflies and grill during the summer. Um, makes a great stew. Leg chops are good, you know, round chops. Um, and there, there's not a lot you really need to do with to it. I like the bone in. I prefer always bone in with when possible. It's more mm -hmm. flavor. The flavors in the bone and the fat. The the meat's just the vehicle, you know. Um, <laughs> So what I'm doing is I'm just sort of removing. So we had we split the the um, hip bone, and so now you have the the pelvic bone here, and what's called the H bone here, A I T C H. Um, and so that's I'm just going to remove that. Again, it, it's got a really tricky shape. And it's just one of those things you begin to learn. You know, it's so much of, of cutting is muscle memory. Um, <laughs> you know, and if, if I lose my way in there, I'll just stick my fingers in there and sort of feel out. It has been a little while since I've broken down the lamb. What's that? Oh yeah, I wear this hat proudly. 
This is where we, I source almost all my lamb and, and especially my mutton from Kinderhook Farm and again, New York. Um, they are 100% grass-fed lamb. Got over a thousand acres for pasture. Um, and I have yet to taste lamb that's better than theirs. So is, is there a cut in the leg itself that produces the most and more intense flavors? Uh, yeah, the more intense flavor, the lower you get. So the, the most intense flavor is going to be in the shank, um, which you can leave on or take off and, and do you know, separately. you have what you, what you market or, or cook as a leg of lamb, but again, you also have a lot of options. Take the shank off and, and have just sort of the round part and use the shank for a braise with the other shanks. Um, you can debone it, tie it as a roast, um, or if you had a band saw, you could do cross cuts and do leg chops, round mm -hmm. chops. That's where you get the asa you go. Right. Um, so, I don't know what you guys want to do, if you want to see me debone the leg, or leave a hole. It's also French shit, that would be sort of a fancy they're, thing they're to do. They're kind of tricky, there's, there's a little the, maybe debone it. Debone it? Yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. So, I'll, uh, I'll try to debone this the way I would debone a leg of beef. I've carved a bunch of those on action stations, uh -huh. and that bone always kind of and it gets into you. Yeah. A little bit. The best thing to do with the leg is really just, again, you're following those seams and they'll take you right to where you want to be. This is a nice cut right here. Hmm. Is this lunch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little quicker cut you can do it. Uh, so another, another aspect that uh, some of the staff members had mentioned is that they wanted to um, learn to use and play with the new smoker we got. Ooh. So we actually spent yesterday smoking meats for uh, the lunch today. Oh. Is it a big smoker? It's yes. a big one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 108 inch trailer. Oh wow. <laughs> Only at Hatches. <laughs> no other account can do this. <laughs> In fact, if I saw one of the grounds guys, I was going to ask him to drag it out to the farm so we could all see it later. But it's over by the dining hall now. Yeah. Do you want to do that, Andy? I'm going to drag it out to the farm. Do you want to ask him to do that? Yeah. I can ask him. Yeah. 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 Andy, how much lamb are you serving now? It's on once in a cycle. Oh. And how do you serve it? What's that? And how do you do it? You do a stew. You do it with a blanket shire. That's cool. Maybe we did like a lamb. That wasn't on in the spring, but yeah, we did. We did opened up grilled and finished the oven and carved. Uh, yeah, so I'm looking at this and I, I have you know, two options if we get start doing whole lamb. You're going to serve it as a oh, roast or serve it as a stew because I'm not grinding yet. So. What percentage of this is roast and what percentage is stew? This is a Looks like we probably have about 60 40 of roast to stew. I think there's more roast. I mean, I think I really think you have a lot of room to play there. Yeah. I mean, and it depends what kind of roast you do. I think you can roast the whole leg for sure. Yeah, yeah. the leg, the shoulder. <laughs> They wouldn't like the sausage? Well, I can't grind. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'd love to do... Can you send it out? Um, I wouldn't know where to send it. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the tricky part becomes the chain of custody for me. So when we send a whole animal out to a slaughtering facility that is approved, uh, they can then send it out wherever they want because they own the liability when they give it back to me. So if they, if they can grind it great, you know, we... We, we did get ground pork back this time when we sent it. Yeah. So 
we also had them smoke and cure our hands because we didn't have the big smoker yet. We only had cabinet smokers yeah, and the, the hands on it. I mean, how big was the last picture you did cure? Oh, they, they, they were, were over 300 pounds going in. Yeah, okay. so we had a piece of tendon. These were right big there. hands and they weren't going to fit. So oh, we took Sibeli's yeah, back because we know we can two, cut them uh, bacon and do them in half in, 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 our, <coughs> in our old cabinet and two Bradley smokers and get them on Amazon. like four and fifty. Yeah. So it's way two of those, and we were doing yeah, bacon and smoked uh, salmon. Uh, we can get through a fair amount. And we weren't, and you know, if we did smoke turkey, we put it in there for, what did you do? Tell me. An hour or two, and then we'd finish it in the oven. So we we're just getting smoke on things with that. But now with the big smoker, we can, you know, we can, we can keep our, our hands on the next pig and try curing and smoking them. But our hospital plant wasn't doing it, but they were sending it out, and then it was coming back through them. So I don't know if they would then take a dead animal, like it would be, I'm sorry, meat. <laughs> uh, so if, if we were to say, okay, here, you slaughter, send it back, we'll do some processing, and here's some meat back, can you grind it for us? I don't know if that's... How do the kids respond to all you're doing? Do they get it? I mean, yeah, some of them love it. I mean, I, they, two it. students did a, a survey <laughs> after a year of sort of changes. So it was after 18 months. So we sort of started sort of drastically changing things January last last school year. What was that, 2012, January? Uh, I can tell you and nice January 2013, two of the seniors were doing a, a co-curricular project That's nice. with the dining hall. That messaging, and I was pleasantly surprised at the number of people who cared about where their food came from, and wanted to know more, wanted food to be uh, healthy and sustainable. Uh, That's great. Yeah, and I think only six percent, six percent said they wanted the dining hall to go back to the way it was. French fries. That I was. <laughs> <laughs> we do serve French fries. They're not available every day like they used to be. They're it's on Monday, so we do usually some you sort don't of bake burger. Them? What's that? You don't bake? No, we fry the french fries. Twice. <laughs> <laughs> I think they missed the dessert. What's that? I think they missed the dessert. They missed dessert, yeah. <laughs> so that's the other difficult thing is that my contract also says I have to reduce sugar, salt, and fat every quarter. So <laughs> pretty soon everything's going to be pretty flavorless. Um, so I, 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 I need to sort of maybe amend that in the contract. Who drives that contract to say that you have to reduce it? Well, I mean, it's up to the client. Um, and the client chose that they wanted to yeah, reduce Yeah, so they basically, they took Sodexo's sustainability plan, which is called the Better Tomorrow <laughs> Plan, and had 14 commitments. And they said, okay, put metrics on all of that. And then now put that in the contract. And now make progress on that. So the ones that, some of them are reduce energy, reduce carbon, reduce water, um, you know, support the global community, um, reduce waste organic and non-organic. Uh, but the food ones are uh, sourced locally and sustainably, uh, which we are tracking now. The uh, reduced sugar, salt, and fat, um, increased vegan, vegan, vegetarian, and well-balanced options. So those are like the three big food ones. So I think we've done that pretty well. Um, uh, I was actually talking to Gary last night. So Gary um, runs the Lawrenceville Academy food program. He has his own Lawrenceville School. <laughs> Lawrenceville School. School. Lawrence good. Academy is different. No, I was like Lawrenceville. It's Lawrenceville, but it's Lawrenceville not. Lawrenceville is not an academy. We get school. people confused with that Sorry. school world. <laughs> yeah. uh, so he has a, a company called Sustainable Fair that does that. He was talking about the. Uh, he has a frozen yogurt machine too that he makes his own sorbet. Mm -hmm. He's gonna try that. <laughs> You know what's interesting? The difference between the schools and the universities. The universities want to do this, but they don't want to necessarily get us into the talk and the talk and walk and walk as much as some of the independent schools do, especially in the They all want some parts of it. They don't want to spend the investment, or maybe they don't have the real estate like with the farm stuff to do what the students say they want to do. Well, I mean, we're getting. I don't know, 1.5% of our food from the farm in a good year, so we're not talking. It's not that much. No, but it's, it's a lot, but it's, it's not. It's yeah. a lot compared to what everybody else Sure. 
Uh, but there is, but when we look at our 35% of our food is real now, as defined by the Real Food Challenge, which for those who aren't familiar is uh, local, ecologically sound, humane, or fair, and it has to be one of those. Um, and then there's different levels, so if you hit two, and they define local in two ways, there's A and B, 150 and 250. So from that, we were tracking at 35 for the spring mm -hmm. semester. So there's still a lot they can do. I mean, this wasn't from our farm. That, that wasn't. Um, but I find the best part is that at the independent school level, the, the administration feels that the dining hall should be part of the education as well, whereas at the college level, they won't be able to buy in, so it's much more of a free market, like whatever the kids want. It's also generational, just it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's... it's I think one of the yeah. biggest differences I see when working with like public schools, independent schools, and colleges, universities, and the definition of how the contract is ran and negotiated. Most of your independent schools are what's known as a fee account, where your risk of profit and loss is not driven by your customers as much as a college, where the students are more involved in uh, making decisions by their dollars because of mm. participation. You get a school in a, in a uh, meal plan that doesn't participate, and then it's a real challenge. So it is consumer driven, but it goes back to the education component and what kids are actually looking for. And that's a big challenge I see in public schools where um, the National School Lunch Program is a major part of it, but then when you get into what's known as the a la carte, is where all the garbage is, but where all the companies make their money, because the kids are programmed and marketed to to want this food. I know up in, uh, up in Vermont, our program, it's a small state college, but uh, we're in the process of integrating a lot of the nutritional facts on our website, which is on the Johnson State website, to the students through the health department and the health and environmental science department. So we reach out there, that's something that we do. And uh, There's definitely more students that are aware of what they're eating and then they're making more of a conscious choice as far as what they're gonna eat. So it's really just getting it out to the student and um, it's their choice from there. What was that thing you just did? What was that thing you just did? The belly, the what bacon? is that? The, this this is a, the flank. Uh, Frank, uh, you actually, this is the flank stick. Tiny. Familiar? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine it three or four times bigger. And if you wanted to make bacon, you could leave the flank on with the belly. You would break this down differently. Oh, I see. Deep down the whole thing. Got you. Oh, we also did lamb cheddar, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lamb cheddar. Yeah. So it's like pan cheddar, which is raw. <laughs> Got the loin and the sirloin. <clears throat> is there any tall fat in the way? Uh, well, that's a great question. I guess it would be all fat around the kidney, right? No, stomach. Stomach? Yeah. I would imagine there is, but I, well, I don't know. Yeah, I there is. Actually, Usually that's where the majority of it is marketed from lamb. Oh, really? Mm hmm. Interesting. So, call fat is going to be a very thin layer of fat, looks sort of like a web. Um, I guess it holds the stomach, but. Um, it's great for sort of hand rolling sausage. Yeah. You can sort of use a force meat in it, roll it up, and it. The Italians the do that. They it it wrap just up melts into it. Pork it's liver. Really good. Is that is that the uh, what you see on the haggis? No, that's the actual stomach. Okay. <laughs> I don't mean like that they didn't leave the fat on the stomach. Oh, I don't know. I haven't made haggis. I haven't seen it on haggis that I've seen. Okay. But so that's really true. It's not, I think they usually remove it when they eviscerate, separate it from the stomach, I think, when they eviscerate the animal. Um, yeah. Uh, but I've only ever eviscerated it. That's how he tucks his thumb from the song. Yeah, that's how he keeps it. How did you determine how far to come down on the on the line? Because of that turn, that foam turn. Exactly right. See, so it okay. starts to, so I sort of go one in, 
really looking to hit the tip of the sirloin bone right there. Okay. So where I go where it starts to angle and then I go one vertebrae in. Okay. And that you wouldn't do on a band saw. Like yeah. um, <laughs> no, I think I usually do that. The hand saw. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you can even do it without a hand saw just of breaking it to okay. find the joint. Um, this is the most underutilized cut of lamb. It's a sirloin. Um, it makes an unbelievable little roast for like two or three people. Um, traditionally in America, it's left on the leg, it's boned out and then tied over. And uh, I think that does a real disservice to this muscle. Um, I think leg is, is better done sort of medium. Um, whereas sirloin is really good, rare, or medium rare. Um, plus, and again, this is from my retail perspective, which is, is different than the institutional perspective probably, but you know, for most people, a leg is uh, it's a lot for one family yeah. to eat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that's gonna feed easily six to eight people. I don't know what kind of family you have. <laughs> 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 it's being six in my house. <laughs> Nice the sirloin <coughs> will, will serve, you know, two or three people. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll bone it out, tie it up, and it's really great. Could you even sell it with bone in just like that? Uh, I that haven't. Be you could. It'd be a lot harder to figure out how to cook because yeah. with the yeah. bone in it, it's such an it. unusual shape. Mm -hmm. And there's actually, the, the heat intensifies a little bit more by the bone. Right. Actually, yeah. So, this is really fun to debone. <laughs> Maybe the reason why they add it to the leg. Yeah. It also makes really nice steaks during the summer to just throw on the grill. When you source your meat around here, where do you go besides Kinderhook? Um, well, probably my favorite beef is Allen's. Um, Who? Alan Cockerline. Oh yeah. It's really some of the beef, best beef in the area. Um, for pork, there are really a lot of great pork producers in the area. It's a perfect sort of place to raise beef, uh, pork. Um, the newer farm in New Lebanon, New York, called um, Climbing Tree, that I really love and um, the support. They are uh, sort of taking a book out of a page out of the Italian book, and because uh, there are so many great uh, cheesemakers and dairies in the area, they're feeding their pigs um, whey, particularly from Cricket Creek Farm up in uh, Williamstown. Uh, Sean Stanton of North Plain Farm in Blue Hill raises really, really incredible pork and, and beef. Um, I really think in a lot of ways his is the best. North Blue Hill? North Plain Farm and Blue Hill Farm. He runs two sort of separate but integrated farms. Um, one serves the restaurant Blue Hill in oh, uh, Manhattan. Yeah. Another is his own personal farm. Yeah. Um, Mike Yazzie up in... Uh, Shushan. Shushan. Thank you. Flying Pig. Um, Raven and Boar in Old Chatham. Are most of the farms you use in New York and Connecticut? I don't think you're saying too many of them. Yes. Um, yeah, a lot of them are in New York and Connecticut. Um, Phil Leahy, he's in Lenox. Um, <coughs> Cricket Creek also raises really good pork. You know, what sort of volumes are anyone of them doing? Not each of them, but like. Right. Who's doing serious volume that could even consider selling to somebody like us? Uh, Mike Yazzie is doing serious volume. Yeah. Um, Sean's volume is, is pretty good. Uh, climbing Tree, because they're still pretty new, is sort of fluctuates a little bit. They're still trying to figure out what their market is. And yeah. But they're looking to grow, and they're yeah. looking for a consistent market. And the quality is really great, for the, especially for the price. Is there a breed of lamb that is you know, more known for like a fattier, like a Kobe, or the, or the treatment of Kobe beef kind of 
Yeah, I mean, definitely flavor, breed affects flavor, and there are a few different breeds I, I really like. Um, corn Dorset, or, or regular Dorset, um, is one I really like. Dorper, uh, which is what Kinderhook is mainly raising. Um, Hampshire, uh, one, one lamb farmer I work with is raising Tunis, which is pretty nice. But uh, I find the Dorper and the, the Dorset, especially the Horn Dorset, which is a much older breed, uh, the way they take on fat and flavor is really awesome. So this is a really good quick cut, so if we want to cook some of this, this would be a good one. Yeah, I was going to say, we could just throw that in the oven. <laughs> uh, I cooked this in 15 minutes before. Oh, yeah, we have a grill to put out there. I want to try some hanger. <laughs> Slam smells really good. How many animals are you guys Uh, we've got seven pigs and we're on our second batch of 300 chickens. Hoping to do more this season. Um, um, we'll see. One of the things is that we that we have difficulty with is the weather. Um, we had a pretty high mortality rate with our last batch of chickens, but these chickens are doing really well just because the, it's warmer. It's a lot nicer. We're getting turkeys um, at the end of the month here. Thirty. Forty. Yeah. Right. Nice. <laughs> um, and I don't know if we'll do another round of chickens or not. We'll see. Are we doing any shrimp ponds? Any hey, what? Shrimp ponds? Yeah. That's in the works. Um, although, we're going to budget this year to buy some gear ponds, right? <clears throat> right? Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. Right. Pretty clean. Yeah. <coughs> no, we bought the top end of the original kind of there. 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 Yeah, so spine hybrid. Uh, yeah, I mean, the spine yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a spine. That's uh, the same one how the pound is hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I boil all that stuff up like a nice lamb sauce. It always kills me how, how, how hard it is to sell lamb sauce. No, it's not. I love it. Really? Really? Yeah, it's great. I mean, you know, I really believe you should, when you're doing a braise with lamb, you should use lamb stock. But, uh, it's a hard sell. I mean, lamb is hard. Yeah. yeah, I guess you know, they've got to be, they have to come into the store wanting lamb. Which is cross out. I was really stunned with how much stock we had in the mud. We also we really did a lot of experimenting. With it. I also I took all the the middles, the, the ribs and um, loins, and dry aged the mutton for uh, four weeks, right? It was like a day, day on it, and it really it was really like with the the sham we did the, the leg of lamb, ham. I never had anything like it. Now, do you prefer to keep the skin on, or do you? Uh, take it off usually the for like just personal like when you're cooking well, do you leave the only thing that skin that I get the skin on is pig everything else is skin um, once it's slaughtered so what I'm removing right now is the, the silver skin which sort of is a tougher membrane it doesn't chew it doesn't cook down it, yeah I mean not all with how fast you'll skin on everything else will take if you cook it low and slow, like around two, 240, that'll break down? Yeah, but this isn't something you want. This isn't a cut you would want to cut right. slow. I mean, that's why I would leave it on, like, the shoulder, but not on this. Mm -hmm. That's such a nice type of piece of meat. <coughs> so with the, uh, with the silver skin, I'm just taking off a piece of it with the tip of my knife, holding it like this, sort of taut, taking my knife, and it's just like filleting a fish. Yeah. And you're running the blade of my knife, and it's important to have it really sharp when you're doing this, sort of up against 
almost scraping against the silver skin. You know, you want as little meat on it as possible. This is so fatty. So then, you have this little nice nub of fat right there. Tie it up. You got a beautiful little roast. Pomegranate uh, molasses. What's that? <laughs> Pomegranate molasses. Yeah, that would be perfect. 